Welcome to the webinar, Our Wild Watershed, Beavers, brought to you by the Laguna de Santa Rosa Foundation and our friends and partners at Occidental Arts and Ecology Center. Again, we invite you to say hello in the chat, and that's also where you can pose questions throughout the presentation. You can find the chat box by hovering around the bottom part of your Zoom screen and selecting the chat button there. My name is Christine Fontaine. I'm the Director of Education at the Laguna de Santa Rosa Foundation. And I'd like to begin this wildlife celebration with a land acknowledgement. A land acknowledgement is a formal statement that recognizes and demonstrates respect for indigenous peoples as traditional stewards of this land and the enduring relationship that exists between indigenous peoples and their traditional territories. The Laguna de Santa Rosa sits within the homeland of the Coast Miwok and Southern Pomo people. To raise awareness for ancestral and current indigenous people's presence in the Laguna watershed, we pay our respect to the past, present, and future generations of Coast Miwok and Southern Pomo people and their Wapo neighbors. We are grateful for the privilege of working for the well being of the Laguna de Santa Rosa watershed. If you'd like to know more about the indigenous land you live on, you can visit the website native land.ca to get started. The Laguna Foundation is a nonprofit organization based in Santa Rosa, California, that works to restore, conserve, and inspire appreciation for the Laguna de Santa Rosa. The Laguna is a 22 mile wetland complex with a 254 square mile watershed that encompasses the businesses, infrastructure, farmland, open space, wildlife, and people living in the Sonoma County communities of Santa Rosa, Rohnert Park, Katati, and parts of Windsor and Sebastopol. The Laguna de Santa Rosa wetlands have been heavily impacted over time by development within its watershed and across the Santa Rosa Plain. It now faces important issues that drive our restoration, conservation, and education work today. Despite the challenges, the Laguna is a biodiversity gem with interconnected plant communities. Excuse me, just lost my spot. Okay, despite the challenges, the Laguna is a biodiversity gem with interconnected plant communities and wetlands that support a rich variety of resident and migrant uh, plants or migratory animals and in, along with endangered and threatened plants and animals. And it has the very special designation of being a wetland of international importance, one of only 34 sites in the United States with this honor. We can serve and restore these special wetlands by planting native trees, shrubs, grasses, and flowers, managing invasive species, and collaborating with our agency and nonprofit partners to improve the overall health of the Laguna. We increase public knowledge and appreciation of the Laguna through our Learning Laguna Elementary School program, our Camp Tule Summer Camp, and community programs like this webinar this evening. Thank you to those of you who made a donation with your registration for this program. Your financial support is greatly appreciated. Our organizations, both ours and Occidental Arts and Ecology Center, do depend on donations from individuals like you to continue our critical restoration, conservation, and education work. You can also donate securely on the Laguna Foundation website and on the Occidental Arts and Ecology Center website. And I'll include links to both of those pages in the chat and also in the follow-up email. This presentation is being recorded and it will be available for you to view and share from our YouTube channel this weekend. As we go throughout the program, please feel free to ask questions in the chat and we will have a question and answer period after the presentations. All right, 
without further ado, it's my honor to introduce our speakers this evening. Kate Lundquist and Brock Dolman are co-direct the Sonoma County-based Occidental Arts and Ecology Center, and their Water Institute, and the Bring Back the Beaver campaign. Kate is a conservationist, educator, ecological artist, and wetland, or excuse me, wildland tender. She collaborates with landowners, communities, conservation organizations, and resource agencies to uncover obstacles, identify strategic solutions, and generate restoration recommendations to assure healthy watersheds, water security, listed species recovery, and climate change resiliency. Brock is a co-founder of Occidental Arts and Ecology Center. He's a wildlife biologist and watershed ecologist who has been actively promoting the idea of rewilding beaver in California since the early 2000s. He was given the Salmonid Restoration Federation's coveted Golden Pipe Award in 2012 for his leading role as a proponent of working with beavers to restore native salmon habitat. With that, I will pass it over to you, Brock. Great, thank you, Christine. And hi, everyone out there in Zoom land. I don't get to see you, but thank you for all being here. And we're really looking forward to Kate and I are talking about beavers with you. So um, just for everybody's sense of things, um, Kate and I are going to, I'll do the first half of the show and then Kate's gonna do the second half of the show. And then as Christine said, we're gonna save time for questions and answers. So, but by all means put questions in the chat, we'll be monitoring those, but then we can do more formal questions afterwards. So with that, I'm gonna go to sharing my screen. And thumbs up, looking good, yeah? Okay, all righty, our wild watershed, beavers. So here we go. Wonderful picture of a beautiful beaver dam there. We're just gonna talk more about beaver dams and things. And not to talk too much about it, but again, the Oxidon Arts and Ecology Center in Western Sonoma County. Um, have a look at us, come out and visit us in the spring when our nurseries open, come buy plants that kind of stuff from us. We're a wonderful retreat center out on 80 acres in Occidental. And the Water Institute is one of the primary programs. And one of the things that Kate and I have been really involved with at a statewide level around not, not just beavers, but really collaborative conservation. And we really think about that from the ridge line all the way down to the reef, if you will, and the river and everything in between. So we spend a lot of time as holistic practitioners thinking like a watershed and really again, working from the headwaters all the way down to the ocean, if you will, in this amazing state of California. And we're gonna talk a lot about Sonoma County and the Laguna specifically, but we'll elaborate, but you can see the alphabet soup of logos down there on the bottom where we're, uh, we're convivial collaborators. We like to mimic our castor canadensis because they're colony-based critters and, and they like to work together. They're collaborative in their efforts. One of the things for us at OAC in the Water Institute is we were doing a lot of work in the, in the late 90s, early 2000s, especially in West Sonoma County, on the reality check of the dramatic um, plummeting of the population, if you will, of coho salmon, especially in Sonoma County. And we were involved in many coho recovery efforts, watershed efforts, dam removal, road restoration, in-stream habitat, uh, coho broodstock programs, anything that folks could do, you know, federal, state, private landowners, lots of uh, other NGOs. And at some point, we really started reviewing a lot of literature about beavers and seeing that in Oregon and Washington, especially, there was just a significant amount of peer-reviewed literature correlating the relationship to beavers and the, and the presence of quality beaver habitat uh, inextricably linked to the quality for salmonids and specifically coho salmon. And we started asking the question down here in California, what about beaver? What about them in California? <clears throat> One of the things, and thank you, Christine, for your wonderful land acknowledgement of the, the Southern Pomo Coast Miwok people, the Federated Indians of Great Rancheria, and we at OEC uh, honor and have a long working relationship with. But Kate and I, with other co-authors, did a lot of research on the historic ecology of beavers in California and found ultimately uh, 
a, the name for beaver in over 60 native languages, actually. Um, and here we just put a few of the of the native languages that represent some of the, the tribes that are you know, more around this area here, some of the, the Pomo and the Wapo and the Miwok folks. And so really neat. But just to be clear, we're talking about the North American beaver tonight. The scientific name is Castor canadensis. Actually on planet Earth, or technically planet water, we believe, is there's actually two species of beaver. There's Castor canadensis, which is the North American beaver, and there's Castor fiber, which is the Eurasian beaver that were all over Europe, all the way across parts of, uh, all the way over to Mongolia and far Eastern Russia and such. But we're talking about the uh, North American beaver and they are only in the Northern hemisphere naturally. And so we're not gonna get derailed on the beaver that unfortunately got brought down to Chile and Patagonia and Argentina down there. Considering this is a talk about beaver in Sonoma County, we always love to uh, acknowledge that our very own, uh, what is now known as Sonoma Water, to be the Sonoma County Water Agency, but many years ago, back in the 50s, it was Sonoma County Flood Control and Water Conservation District. And these two lo logos of theirs, we, we always find humorous that we found in some archives. And apparently at Sonoma Water, they refer to the happy beaver and the angry beaver logo. Um, but I think the engineers and people who made big dams admire the dams we're really interested in, which is beaver dams. Um, and that's one thing about beavers that's really amazing is that they're these incredibly adaptable uh, habitat generalists. And beavers occur, well, they're, they're moving quite far north into the tundra now with uh, climate change and warming in the Arctic, actually they're moving north. And there are beavers that go all the way down into the, the um, northern portions of Mexico and throughout the dry country of the, of the canyon lands and obviously all over back east. and for the, the folks from Canada on the call, you you're, you guys know you've got beavers up there in Canada and they were widely distributed in California and they are in mountains, they're in the deserts or they're in urban areas like this wonderful photo by our friend Rusty Cohen of some beavers uh, in a small tributary down near the city of Napa. Um, beaver are vegetarian, they, they don't eat fish, they create habitat for fish, which then the river otters love to come and eat the fish, but the beavers themselves don't eat the fish. Their primary food, and that photo in the middle and the upper left there, is you can see some willows or aspens, and they tend to eat that cambium layer, the, the outside bark, the living outside bark, where the, the phloem and the xylem is, where plants transport their water and their nutrients. And that's really the nutritious food that the beavers eat. But they also eat grass, as you can see in that photo on the right that Rusty Cohen took. They love a good salad mix. They even eat Ludwigia, which is something we all would like to see them eat more of in many of our watersheds, especially the Laguna. So they're quite, uh, they can be quite generalist feeders. Um, they love cattails, they love tulies. Um, and then the fun part about the wood is obviously after they uh, chewed the bark off, they then have a raw material for making their dams and their lodges and those things. Um, beaver are mammals. They, um, what's interesting about a beaver is they're North America's largest rodent. The capybara down in South America is the world's largest rodent, but there are beavers that are, have definitely tipped the scales at well over 100 pounds. They tend to average 40 pounds, 60 pounds. Um, and unlike other rodents that people might think about, mice or rats and things like that, Beavers tend to, um, they tend to basically breed once a year and they're going to have mom and dad. They're gonna have the kits of that season, the little baby ones, like in that picture down in the lower right. They're also likely gonna have some yearlings, which are kind of like the middle school, high schoolers who just, you know, are, haven't decided to leave home yet. And then the juveniles are kind of the, the, the ones that are taking a gap year from college and, and haven't gotten off yet. Um, and so what you'll find in a beaver colony is you've got mom and dad and you basically got three year classes, if you will, three different generations often in one colony. And at some point those juveniles out migrate. The image in the lower left is really a cool shot. Um, they have this special toe and you can see that there's a toenail and then that extra nail next to it. And that's used for grooming. And imagine if you're an aquatic mammal, 
um, and you need to keep that fur dry and well oiled. After sea otter and river otter beavers, they have some of the highest density of hair follicles per square inch of, of any of the mammals. So imagine you've got this incredible fur coat that's waterproof that you need to groom. They have cool swim goggles. They have a flap in their throat. So when they're underwater carrying sticks, it closes off and they don't get too much water in their mouth. They have these incredible teeth like rodents, they have those incisors that continue to grow and grow. And so they're always needing to um, chew on wood and chew on things to shorten those teeth. And that's a whole part of what they do. So they're very artistic with those teeth. They have an incredible capacity to really utilize those teeth there. Um, so where are the beavers? So thinking about Sonoma County, one thing that's interesting is the Sonoma watershed, which on this map is on the right-hand side on Highway 12, where Sonoma Highway goes past Oakmont towards Glen Ellen and Kenwood and on down to the town of Sonoma and such. The Sonoma watershed is, is, is the beaver hotspot for Sonoma County and has been for many, many years, decades. The beavers come up out of the uh, San Pablo Bay, the North Bay access in that area. And it's interesting though that um, in the Russian River, well, we're going to talk a little bit about some of the history, but beavers haven't been in the Russian for quite a while. And yet back in 2010, 2011, folks started noticing the sign of beavers in Spring Lake, which for folks who know Spring Lake in Eastern Santa Rosa, that's where, um, that's part of the headwaters of the Santa Rosa Creek. And it turns out that we eventually found beaver sign in the golf course ponds in Oakmont. And it looks like the beavers maybe took a hike from Kenwood or Glen Ellen staged out of Oakmont, came over the Russian River, reintroduced themselves into the Russian, went from Spring Lake. Eventually, they were seen down in Santa Rosa Creek. Some years later in 2012, there was a small dam in Santa Rosa Creek down by Willowside Road. And then actually recent signs on and off in the Russian River. And as recent as 2021, actually, Kate and Kevin saw recent shoes over in Riverfront Regional Park along the river there and where the gravel ponds are. And we've been hearing a little bit of rumors of possible beavers down in the lower Russian River, Duncan's Mills, but we have yet to confirm that. And so if anyone wants to confirm any and all of that, by all means, let us know. Again, they're aquatic mammals. One thing about beavers is that they both make these dams and the dam is really about impounding the water because beavers as vegetarians harvest water to irrigate riparian corridors and wetland vegetation to grow the food they need but beavers are also on the menu for things like mountain lions or areas where you have bears and wolves. And so that water is also cover for keeping them away from predators so that they can hide. And beavers either make the classic lodge, like in the lower right there, a lake lodge with that entrance below. But many of our beavers here in California that tend to be river beavers or creek beavers, um, make what we call a bank burrow. And you can see in the lower left where the entrance is below the water, but the den is actually above water and it may be below a root wad or something. And so they're the same beaver, they're Castor canadensis. They just have enough plasticity to adapt their housing to the conditions where they live. Um, and this is just a beautiful uh, image in the High Sierra of an amazing wetland and a whole beaver complex. And you can kind of see that big pond in the center left a little bit. And there's a little island in there. And there's a lot of that, the, the shoreline of that pond um, is, a, is a really long beaver dam. And then there's multiple beaver dams in that whole complex, actually, if you really, if I, let, if I gave you the time to study that image, you could actually find that there's uh, well over a dozen beaver ponds. So they build these complexes. They'll have a primary dam their main home where the lodge will be, but then they're out farming and they're managing wetlands and they're managing vegetation and, and their food. And, and so they've got a whole complex. And yet then there's these urban beavers and they're managing a complex too. And, and the folks, uh, Dr. Heidi Perryman and others in Martinez who now have the wonderful a nonprofit called Worth the Dam, are, are really well known for their beavers in Martinez, their urban beavers. And for many years before COVID, they had a beaver festival. And we look forward to that returning when we're uh, allowed to gather more in person. But in the image on the left, you can actually see where the Amtrak station is in downtown Martinez or 
and there's a beaver dam right there in Alhambra Creek. And so it's a really fun place to go see beavers. One of the things about beavers is, is we refer to them as uh, keystone species. So a keystone in, in sort of the ecological metaphor, if you were a, a stonemason and you were building an arch, you would put false work in that arch and you'd build up the stones. And then there's the keystone, which is the stone at the top of the arch. So that when you remove the false work, the whole arch stays together. And that's really the idea of species like beavers or wolves or salmon or orcas out in the ocean are a species whose presence in the ecosystem disproportionately benefits the health and caring capacity of that ecosystem for many other species besides themselves. And I think beavers are indisputably recognized as a keystone species for many life forms, whether it's various birds, amphibians, reptiles, fish, plant communities, wetland communities. Um, they're just a, an amazing species in, in the habitat that they create and how many other organisms are uh, dependent on, on beavers. Another thing about beavers relative to their relationship to water is that they these beaver dams and the ponds and the associated wetlands that often form uh, in association with those beaver ponds are amazing, as all wetlands are, are amazing biological filters. And it, can it help improve water quality and sequester carbon? And so there was a study in 2007 in South Lake Tahoe in Taylor Creek, if people have been there, about um, looking at the relationship of phosphorus. And people know about the movement to keep Tahoe blue because of the reducing water quality due to nutrient delivery from settle, human settlement in Lake Tahoe. And so the idea that these beaver wetlands were removing phosphorus, which is a critical nutrient that in lakes causes eutrophication and loss of clarity. So we think that the Keep Tahoe Blue people ought to adapt their sign a little bit to recognize that beavers help keep Tahoe Blue as well. And it's a really interesting thing around phosphorus or nitrogen and carbon, or even they found a reduction in fecal coliforms. Um, and so incredible improvements to water quality. And then increasingly, there's been some increased recognition around beavers in the sort of drought and deluge of what we're witnessing lately with the weather whiplash. And so in the drought, when there's not enough water, the beaver are holding water on the landscape and these amazing wetland systems that are so critical. And in the drought, and in this image on the right by Dr. Joe Wheaton in Idaho, adding in fire and wildfire in this area that completely burned off in Idaho, but you see in the middle, these amazing emerald necklace ribbons of the beaver wetlands and the habitat. And these become critical refugia for wildlife um, fleeing the fire. And in fact, they, uh, the folks looking at this fire actually observed a bear that had so uh, sought shelter in this actual spot here to be saved from the fire. So Dr. Emily Fairfax has um, spoken and written a bunch about with some studies about this idea of Smokey the beaver. Um, and in the realms of thinking about beaver dams, again, here you're, you have a structure that's impounding water in the system and slowing the flow. And for us in a Mediterranean climate where we get water in the winter and we have our long dry season, any ability to hold water on the landscape. And so do we live in a water scarce area or is it really a storage scarce area at the right timing? And so how it is that beaver dams can delay the release of water and increase groundwater recharge and augment in-stream flows and, and, and saturate riparian soils and wetland soils for vegetation health is really critical. An interesting um, study that a woman named Carol Evans who worked for the Bureau of Land Management in the Elko District with some uh, mining companies and ranchers up there, working with those ranchers in Susie Creek in near Carlin, Nevada, where the image in the upper left is what the creek looked like in 1992. They had been grazing the cattle during the hot season. So the ranchers decided they would take the cows off in the hot season and give the creek a break. They did that. And a few year, years later, by 99, the wetlands had started growing back and there's more vegetation and the beavers moved in and that lower image is of the beavers who commenced damming that system up, flooding the entire area. They're now aggrading it and we 
Carol Evans just did a video of 30 years of this study, and that system's just gotten better and better and wetter and wetter and more full of life. And the ranchers there attribute their operation. They still have cows and land because of the water during the drought that the beavers um, have given them. So we say we fight incision with incisors and we're sinking our teeth into this thing and letting the beavers do the work for us. And really that's about this relationship of dam building and impoundments and water and all of these multiple functions. And there's a Haida saying that the, the native people of the Pacific Northwest, the Haida, who basically say that beaver taught salmon how to jump. And beaver and salmon have been coexisting symbiotically for um, uh, a long time, <laughs> a really long, long, in human years is a really long time. And so all of these benefits and uh, the idea that beavers um, somehow are harming salmonids, I think there's ample evidence that is not the case. And yet, interestingly enough, based on some work by a couple folks up on the Smith River in Northwestern California, dams aren't the whole story. They're, um, these, they, these bank burrows in the bank actually are called uh, river, they create river reefs in these bank lodges. And there's all this wildlife and, and organisms that are dependent on these river reefs as well. So they don't even need a dam to benefit the system. And so, you know, whether you wanna fight over beavers or not, probably don't wanna get in a food fight with beavers because they're, you know, it's, it's not gonna go well for you. So with that little joke, I am gonna turn it over to Kate Lundquist and let her take it away from here. Wonderful. Thank you, Brock. And wow, I'm so impressed with how many people are zooming in from all over the globe. We got someone from the UK. Wonderful. Hooray, hooray. Well, thank you all for joining us. And I'm going to launch right into talking about our Bring Back the Beaver campaign. So you just heard from Brock all of these amazing reasons why beaver are worthy of admiration and support and restoration. And in California, we noticed that there's been kind of a beaver blind spot. People just either don't even realize they're here or don't know what they do or how beneficial they can be. And so we had to start a campaign to help make sure that people understood how amazing they are. So Brock and I have been doing a ton of outreach and education and getting folks to help us identify where beaver are and other forms of citizen science and a lot of research and demonstration of how to do beaver restoration and ultimately working on policy change because we have to change the rules so that we can support beaver in their amazingness. And so, let me see if, there we go. So what happened? Why is there all of this confusion in California in particular? People always wonder, gosh, what's up, California? What, what's going on there? Well, they are in fact native to California. They've been here for hundreds of thousands of years and they were almost trapped to extinction very early on, as it turns out. Those sea captains were coming over and trapping anything they could find, including beaver. And beaver, if you don't know this, are really desirable because their pelt makes the perfect waterproof felt. How many people have a 100X beaver hat? You know how amazing that felt is. And also their castoreum glands provide scent for perfumes still to this day. And back in the day, they were used a lot for medicine. And so, this was the currency at the time. This is how all of the colonization was funded, was on the backs of all of these poor beaver. And lucky for us, they weren't totally decimated. They were, I'm trying to find my cursor. Here we go. Some survived in California, enough so that thankfully our division of fish and game, as it was called then, was able to repopulate the state with beaver and return them to their former range. And so this map on the left here, you can see has all these little dots. And those are basically places where beaver were returned to where they formerly lived. And back in the day, they were doing it by horseback. They were using these special suitcase traps to trap them in. And in some cases where they couldn't reach the back country, they were in fact bowing them out of airplanes. It's true. Idaho started it first, the great 
experiment succeeded and many beaver were uh, sent into new lands this way. And if you haven't seen the video of it, there's some great black and white footage of this. If you look it up online, you can see it happening in action. And California, of course, wanted to join the crew and do the same. And so they too started throwing beaver out of airplanes. And many of the beaver that we have to this day up in the Sierra Nevada came uh, in this fashion. Imagine that. So thankfully there was so much attention and focus on beaver and the benefits that they could provide our state that they even commissioned this report, the status of beaver in California in 1942. And Donald Tappy did a very exhaustive uh, job of trying to interview trappers at the time in the 30s and 40s, trying to figure out where were the beaver and created this map. And this, all of these hatched lines that you see in the upper Modoc Klamath area and the Central Valley area, and then down in the Colorado River, that is where they believed at the time beaver were native to. And this has stuck to this day that people still think that this is where beaver were native to, which means they still think they're not native to the coast and not native to the Sierra. And why is this important? It's important because it affects the way that people manage them. They think, well, you moved them around and they were only native to these little areas. So we got to trap them out and get rid of them because they're, they're a nuisance and we don't want them around. And so it sounds a little bit more like a management problem than an actual uh, historic range problem. And so we got together and said, okay, we got to do some research here and figure out where in fact these beaver were native because we don't necessarily agree. And so pouring over the history books and looking through all the different archeological records and all of these different amazing ethnographic accounts. Brock mentioned the 60 names for beaver and native California languages. There were some dams that had been uncovered up in the Sierra that we had carbon dated and they go back pre-contact, some as old as 530 AD. And so this was good proof of like, okay, we can rethink where beaver are native to now. They did occur in the Sierra. We've got this physical evidence and then lots of historic accounts. And like I said, lots of ethnographic accounts as well. We have pictographs, we have different uh, ceremonial items that were made with, with beaver pelts. So right here in the Laguna de Santa Rosa, we have uh, a citation from General Vallejo himself. When he came through here in 1833, he noticed that there were these great Tulare lakes teeming with beaver, which is what the Laguna still is to this day. It's this amazing wetland and there are beaver that have come through there. And so um, this was good news that they were back they were hanging out back then and still to this day now they are returning there, which is fantastic. We also found some accounts from our local Salmon Creek and the Russian River as well. So a sea captain came through and was toured around the Russian ranches and sure enough, there were the former habitations of a beaver in Salmon Creek. And then in Guerneville, they were trapping and hunting beaver. And the last record of historic records that we could find was from 1881 in the Russian River. And so with them returning in, in 2010, as far as we can tell, they, it was after 137 year absence that they, they came back, which is fantastic news because the Russian River could really benefit from their presence. We have not checked all the bars to make sure that we are, not overlooking any beaver, but if you see any there, let us know. So this whole beaver restoration movement has emerged in the last 20 years and has really taken off in California in the last 10. And it's based on this huge body of science. And it's not just beaver restoration, but it's also what we call process-based restoration and really restoring our riverscapes to give them the space that they need to load them with the wood that they're used to having and to have those beaver thriving in these systems and modifying them and, and making them these amazing wetlands that, that they used to be 
before we came and drained them all and so that we could farm them. So we have been doing this work all over the state now, collaborating, as Brock said, with amazing partners. And there's so many different opportunities because we have beaver in many places across the state. So we're really grateful that we gotten to work all the way up in the Sierra and all the way down to the coast, helping folks with coexistence and with beaver mimicry and with enhancing the beaver, taking care of the beaver that we already have and really trying to support them in returning to their former range. This is a recruitment strategy that we did with the, the Maidu up in the valley that they have been given back from PG&E. And this is a really exciting project I'll talk more about. So how do we live with them? Is it possible? Seems like people get really frustrated, understandably. Culverts are a place that beaver love to come up. For them, it's just this convenient hole in a roadbed, which to them looks like a dam. And all they have to do is plug it up and boom, they've got more water impounded. So what we can do is we can outsmart them and put in fences so that they can't get at the culvert and therefore can't block it. And these are being used all over, really successful, low tech, low cost. Then we end up, beavers love to flood things, right? This is what they do. They are so good at it. We like having their dams. They provide all this habitat. We wanna keep that habitat. How do we keep the habitat and mitigate any potential flooding that we aren't comfortable with? Well, this is where a flexible pond leveler device comes in. That's what's illustrated on the bottom there. And so basically you take this flexible pipe and you notch the dam and you put it through the dam and then you set the height of the pond. You keep it deep enough so that the beaver will stick around but you lower it enough so it's not flooding your roads and your pathways and whatnot. And so you can see here pictured on the left, we've been working with the Sonoma County Water Agency on Friar Creek, which is densely populated. There's houses on either side and the beaver have shown up and started building all these dams. We've got four of these devices in now and they're doing great. The beaver flooding has been brought down to a minimum, they get to stick around, the ducks are there, the mink are there, all the different species are coming in. And so it's, it's a really great way to, to have it be a win-win situation. We're really excited about this pilot that we started with this beaver back saver device that the US Fish and Wildlife Service up at the Sutter National Wildlife Refuge designed and implemented on their own. And when we found out about it, we were like, wow, this is amazing. We need to get the word out about this because in wetland situations where you have these weirs that are conveying water from one wetland to another, the beaver love to block those up. And it's creating a lot of unnecessary labor. Folks are having to clear these out every day in many cases. And so we thought, well, shoot, we gotta get this word out and, and try it in other cases, as other different sites as well. So we got to go out to the Roosevelt Ranch, which is a duck club in the Central Valley and install one as a pilot. And we have other folks that are interested. We have rice farmers, we have folks that, because beaver love wetlands, right? And this is a really common area for them to come in and wanna gum things up. And so we're really excited to see how this works and to get the word out and support other folks in use, utilizing it themselves. Beavers, being the herbivores that they are, are gonna be chewing down trees and wanting to eat your prized vegetation. They love those Merlot vines off of Sonoma Creek and have been killed for it. So we wanna support folks in figuring out a way to prevent the beer from doing that. They clearly have good taste in wine, can you blame them? So we can prevent them from getting access by putting fences around our vegetation. You can even do hot wire to pr protect larger areas. And if you have a place where you need to maintain aesthetics like this photo on the left, you can take exterior la latex paint, color match it to your bark and put some masonry sand in and paint it on and do the fine little knots and everything like that. And the one with the fluoro tape is the one that's painted. You can barely tell, right? Whew, boy, that's enough to make me wanna go to the doctor and get some help, right? So 
this project that we're doing in Plumas County with the Maidu, who are part of this group called the Maidu Summit Consortium, they got given back this 2300 acre valley that used to have beaver in it. And we found old remnant beaver dams that carbon dated back 1270 years. So we know they were there and they've just got hunted out. And so we want them back and the tribe really wants them back. So we're trying to support them in doing that. So what we're doing is we're mimicking beaver and we're building these beaver dam analogs and these post assisted log structures and all these different ways that you can do beaver mimicry. That's very light touch, low tech, but has a really wonderful impact. And so you can see in the upper right photo, the burned trees in the back. Well, we put these structures in and then the Dixie fire came through and burned over the whole meadow. But the meadow having these structures was a lot wet, wetter and it didn't get as damaged as it could have. And then the big flood with the atmospheric river came through the, the next in October and some of the structures adjusted and we just got to get back out there and, and um, gussy them up and, and make them working well again. So it's, it's a really fantastic way to do this work. And ideally it will bring beaver. And actually in this case, we think we're not sure if it's one or two, but some beaver have shown up. So it's pretty exciting. Here's a great case study down in Lincoln, California, in the, in the lower foothills, where the Placer Land Trust acquired this land and they were wanting to restore it. And they had a grazer who was leasing the land, but it just had this single threaded channel and it was pretty dry and there wasn't a lot of water out there. And so they, they had adopted the previous landowners practice of, of killing the beaver because they wanted to protect the vegetation. And when they decided to get help from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to do more restoration, they said, sure, we'll work with you, but you got to sign a beaver peace treaty first. And so they agreed and not only stopped killing the beaver, but with the guidance from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, started reinforcing the dams and expanding them. And then they broke down the levees on the side because they had space. And within a three year period, the beaver had basically taken over the entire wetland and increased the wetted area by a thousand percent. And the budget for this project was under $75,000. So very low cost for the amount of gain that they got. And now this is one of our best case studies we have in California. So what about relocation? Can we just move beaver around? Because there's places where they haven't come back yet. What do we do? Well, here I am with my partner, Kevin, doing beaver relocation in Colorado and Washington. Turns out in California right now, we are not allowed to relocate beaver. We cannot possess or move them. But this is one of the policy things that Brock and I are working on with the department and with others discussing what would it take? How could we make this possible? Could we mimic other states' policies and, and do this here? Thankfully, we did have the Wildlife Protection Act pass in 2019. And so recreational trapping is no longer allowed of beaver. So that's going to help the population rebound. We don't know how many beaver we have in California right now. And so it, we're all just kind of operating in the dark, which is a little frustrating, especially since any landowner can apply for a depredation permit, which is what this last bullet is talking about. So if a beaver is causing you damage, you can get a permit to kill a beaver. And Brock and I are in a process right now with our partners from the Environmental Protection Information Center and the Center for Biological Diversity to do a regulation change so that it, we can condition those permits to make sure that non-lethal strategies have been exhausted before a permit is issued. So that's something that's underway. And there's also another process underway with the, uh, the NOAA Fisheries uh, is doing a consultation with the APHIS Wildlife Services to uh, make sure that listed fish are not being killed when beaver are being killed. Super important work. So, if you aren't familiar with these resources, we have this amazing booklet that we put together that has a synopsis of everything that we've been talking about tonight that you can download for free on our website. 
Similarly, the book Eager by Ben Goldfarb is a really fantastic read. It's, there's a whole chapter on California and it covers beaver all over the world. So if you haven't read that yet, very entertaining, really well researched and highly, highly, highly recommend that. And we really could use your help. And this is true all over, not just for California, but we need to know where our beaver are. It's really hard to manage them if we don't know where they are, how many there are, what are they doing? How are they doing? I saw a lot of people in the chat saying, yeah, I saw a beaver, but then it dried out and they moved away or I've never seen a beaver. Well, this is a great way you can actually find where there are beaver to go check out, assuming it's on publicly accessible property. So we're using iNaturalists. It's a really, um, at this point, it's the best we have for tracking beaver populations. And since we've been using it, we've done some, we did a beaver blitz where we went out. It's like a bio blitz, but it was focused on beaver using iNaturalists. And we went out across Sonoma County to all the places we knew that beaver were possibly located and verified. And you could do that as well in, in your community and really try to figure out where are they and what are they doing and do we have current sign? And then you can continue to update it year after year. And, and that way, we, you know, the whole scientific community and citizens alike and policymakers can then refer to this and we can have it all in one place. So highly recommend you check that out if you haven't already. And if you don't know what beaver signs look like, these are the signs that we have in our booklet. So dams can be a really great and helpful sign. That can be one of the more obvious ones. So sometimes they're overgrown and, or they're made with rocks and they are, is it a dam or is it a log jam? People get really confused. Um, so start, you know, if you aren't familiar, start getting familiar with them, go out there and check it out. Bank lodges, uh, Sometimes they'll do the sticks just on top of the bank burrow and you'll see that. Sometimes there'll be no sticks at all and you'll just see an entrance with a channel. Those are really fun to try to look for. Uh, beavers make canals like crazy. This is a huge part of their effect on, on the areas that they manage. And if you have ever tried to walk across a beaver wetland, you find out pretty quickly how deep those canals are. <laughs> I speak from experience, having fallen into many and gotten, you know, up to my chest in deep water. Um, so those are really great signs to look for as well. And then if you're lucky, tracks, um, chewed sticks is also a really helpful way to, to find them. You know, we do have muskrat that chew little sticks, but beaver tend to do lots of little ones and then big ones here and there as well. So if you've got some big ones felled, then you're, you can be pretty certain that the, this is a beaver, not a muskrat. And then there's scent mounds. This is how they communicate with one another to claim their territory, but also to give their relatives like the hay, like we're over here. Uh, so sometimes you can smell the beaver before you actually see their sign. Scat's really hard to find, but it's usually just a pile of sawdust in the bottom of the pond. So if you have, if you didn't get a chance to come to our beaver summit, we, we had the first ever beaver summit in April and it was a huge success. Over a thousand people attended and we had two days of sessions, really high level, amazing, short but sweet, succinct to the point and um, they're all available now uh, on the website listed here and you can pick and choose which talks you want to listen to. Highly recommend that. It'll really, it's a great crash course on what's happening with beaver in California and I'm hoping we'll do it again next year. So stay tuned for that. And for those of you who want to actually get involved and do more for your local beaver populations. We have some great examples in California of people taking beaver matters into their own hands. In addition to the Martinez beavers, we now have the Slow Beaver Brigade in San Luis Obispo County, and they do tours, they do river cleanups, and they are raising funds to support non-lethal coexistence structures and a lot of education. And then we have the Fairfield beavers, which are 
very nearby Sonoma County over in Fair Fairfield. And they have this great brochure that shows you where you can walk along Laurel Creek and other areas as well and see all the different lodges and dams. And so it's this great walking tour. So if you haven't checked that out, you should. And you could do that yourself in your own neighborhood if you're having to be lucky enough to be living amongst beaver. So we too are keystone species. As Brock likes to say, we can be a degenerative disturber or a regenerative disturber. And I would uh, invite us all to try to be more of the regenerative type of disturber. And so just how we live and how we support beaver and all of our other important keystone species is going to really make a difference. And um, I really appreciate that all of you are here tonight listening to all of this because it takes all of us. It's a group effort. We have lots of work ahead of us. And, you know, if you want to join the beaver colony and, and uh, help out in that regard, we would be most grateful. So that's all I have to say on the matter. And I know it's probably a little early. If there's something else we want to chat, I'm sure we've got lots of questions to talk about um, in the chat. So I'm going to stop there. And maybe before you move that off, Kate, someone earlier in the chat mentioned that they had seen the stuffed beaver at Pepperwood. And this image here is that stuffed beaver at Pepperwood for that person who commented earlier. <laughs> There you go. Yes. The, yes, that was a great presentation. That was also where I learned about the board game, Dam Builders, which is a 70s classic. Um, the inventor was there himself. So check that out on eBay. It's a pretty fun beaver game. Okay. Right. So thank you, Christine. Um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen so we can all get bigger and, um, and then how about we answer some questions? There's one that came up recently that I, um, I think will be kind of fun to answer. <laughs> um, what is the scent mound made of? Great question. <laughs> well, they tend to pile up mud to make it taller. If you've ever seen like a lot of mammals do this who are scent marking, they want the smell to get high up and then they will deposit two scents. They have an anal oil that they produce and then castoreum. And the castoreum is made of all of the different chemicals from the plants that they're eating. So it varies depending on what they're eating, but it's quite distinct. And this is the substance that they're using for um, perfumes and um, in some cases, artificial flavors as well. <laughs> Interesting. That, that vanilla ice cream that you've been thinking was natural vanilla might have been back in the day beaver castorium flavor. Huh. And Kate showed a photo of that early on when the trapping piece and men made mention of this that beaver were not only sought for that amazing fur for the felt but actually the castorium glands because they were so useful for so many purposes back in the day that was as much a a driver of the hunting and trapping as the fur was many times or equally. Yeah, I want to look into that. That's that's new news to me. <laughs> I want to research that a little bit more. Um, thank you for sharing that information. Um, another question um, are, what's the relationship between beavers and muskrats? That one came up in the chat as well. Brock, you want to um, that? Well, you know, they're, they're both they're both rodents and they're both aquatic, but other than that, they, they coexist. And, but muskrats themselves, you know, they, they can, they pile up little nests and sticks and things, but they don't build dams and they don't do that work. So they're, they're taxonomically really different critters. And they, again, they do coexist. And there, it is often observed that muskrats will, in certain lodges and areas in beaver habitat, will um, co-inhabit. Co parts of beaver complexes and things of that nature. They seem to get along fine and do well, but um, yeah, they're, muskrats don't build dams and don't do all that, the heroic engineering that beavers do though. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. Kate mentioned, yeah, that David Attenborough's got a great, 
uh, everything David Attenborough does. Imagine David Attenborough doing beavers, right? So it's an amazing foot and they do show the muskrats cohabitating. Yeah, I think I've seen that. Um, is it true that some people misidentify muskrats as beavers? Yeah, it's fairly common. Muskrats tend to be a little smaller and they tend to keep their tail up when they're swimming. So you'll see kind of a line going behind them that's their tail cutting the water surface. And beavers tend to keep their tails underwater and they're a little bigger. And then if you get the tail slap, then that's, a no, that's like a big indication of, oh, that's beaver, not muskrat. And yeah. then we have, what is our invasive, our- um, There's the uh, nutria that has <laughs> yeah. showed up, you know, and down in the Merced area and a little bit in the San Joaquin that is a non-native rodent. And a lot of people are quite concerned about it. And if you saw a photo of them and weren't really paying, didn't know the details of a beaver face versus a nutria, they could kind of look the same. They obviously don't have that big flat tail. Like nobody's got the big flat tail, but the beavers there, that's their, but on the front end, uh, if you see a lot of pictures, some, it's a common occurrence for us beaver believers that people will post a photo of what they think is a beaver and it'll be a nutria. And if you look at the face, nutria have a white, kind of a white little beard and mustache with whiskers. And it shows like, like as if they were a little bit like an older beaver and beavers, <laughs> beavers don't have that white whitish hair and whiskery thing on the front. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. That's good, good information to help us identify them perhaps out in the field. Um, another question, are beaver typically fearful of people? Do they tend to run away when they see people? They don't generally run uh, unless mm -hmm. you catch them on land. <laughs> Just, but they can run. I've actually seen video of them running. Um, they are, they can be shy of humans, uh, which is part of the reason why they're hard to see. Not all beaver come out in the day. A lot of them are sleeping during the day. You will tend to see them more during the crepuscular hour, dawn and dusk. However, I've seen beaver that like come and check you out. You know, it really depends on, on the beaver. Um, and there have been some cases where beaver can, you know, they get protective. And, and so we, I generally give them lots of space. And if I'm lucky to see them, then consider myself, yeah, if I see one, consider myself really lucky. But in general, I have, I have, of all the beaver I've seen over the many years I've been watching beaver, I have not encountered an aggressive one, but I have had ones be curious and come check me out for sure. Yeah, thank you. Uh, another question from the chat, they're rolling in now. Um, thank you for the great presentation. Do you know what the status of, is of beaver reintroduction in West Marin? I hear Walker Creek is being considered for reintroduction. Oh boy, do we know since we're kind of the ones leading that charge, right? <laughs> Was that, maybe that's a ringer in the room. We better see if somebody slipped us a ringer in that question. Um, so for what it's worth, currently there are no beaver in either West Marin, the, the watersheds that drain, say, just Tamales Bay or the Esteros or even down to Pine Gulch. Um, and we don't know, have any positive sightings of beaver on the Eastern side and say Richardson Bay and some of those areas. Um, the, there's a lot of local interest in communities in West Marin. And Kate and I did a talk, which I believe we could probably find you the link for, of a specific talk for West Marin folks about beavers in West Marin and the, um, the consideration around that. And so Kate and I were received a little, some funding from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to create a, a steering committee with folks from Spawn, the, um, for a little while, Malt, the, the RCD, the Marin RCD, some private landowners. There were folks from Walker Creek there, the Environmental Action Committee, and beginning to just think about what would it look like? Is it appropriate? Where would it be appropriate? Is there habitat for beavers? What would be the landowner opinion about that? What are the opportunities for coexistence? And so we produced or, or about uh, a preliminary draft report that has yet to come out um, of, with that idea. So there's no decisions have been made, obviously, but um, we're still 
considering that, but for the person who brought up Walker Creek, there are many aspects of Walker Creek that look very viable for beaver. There's plenty of flow there because of dam release. There's really good vegetation and especially in lower areas. Um, there's a lot of potential cover there. Um, some of the landowner, uh, op there's some opportunities for what we call ecosystem restoration to restore the ecosystem. There's some, uh, some of that kind of work is likely needed there. Lagunitas is interesting. It's also got some ecosystem issues. Uh, Olima is interesting. That's an ecosystem issue. So it's a, it's a, a bit of a conundrum. Yeah, there's always a lot of um, interests involved in these sort of big ecosystem picture views, I think. Um, so these seminars and talks like this to give people really strong grounded information are so important. So again, kudos to you for stepping forward and, and talking with us tonight. Um, here's another question. You mentioned beavers repopulating Sonoma Creek by way of San Pablo Bay. So does that mean beavers travel through salt water? They do. Yeah, there's evidence of beaver going across salt water uh, from mainland to islands and also from islands to mainland. So they can certainly withstand it to get across and they can live in fairly brackish water as well. So Alhambra Creek, the lower area there is tidally influenced and they can withstand a certain percent of salinity. They're up in the Skagit Delta in Washington. Uh, we have a lot of places where they live in that, that brackish zone. And yes, if, if they need to swim across a saltwater body, they will. <laughs> <laughs> Very good, thank you. Um, here's another one. I've seen otter on a beaver lodge. Would they be hunting the young? Um, there are cases where otter, river otters, have, have been documented to predate uh, the kits of beaver, maybe the yearlings. Um, so it's, you know, otters are, are fierce predators, mustelids, you know, they're related to wolverines and badgers, so just a, a, an aquatic wolverine, basically, and they hunt in packs. Um, but otters and beavers clearly coexist everywhere you've got good beaver habitat, generally, if there's otters in the area, they, they coexist. And so... While they can predate them, it doesn't appear that that's like a, a significant, um, you know, population issue for sure. So basically, the all the people who love the otters, like the otter spotters, I don't know if Megan Isidore has been before, but a good friend of ours. Um, you know what? They, they love the beavers because beavers make fish habitat and otters eat fish and crawdads and, you know, that kind of stuff and ducks. Um, so I think that as a keystone species, beavers definitely benefit the otters. Yet another reminder, it's all connected. Um, another question, um, again, they keep rolling in, this is, this is fun. Um, would you be able or willing to tell us where we might see dams or other beaver structures in Sonoma County? Well, certainly the Friar Creek beavers in, Sonoma, in the city of Sonoma, you can, there's a walking path right there that the public can access and you can see several dams along that path. So that's a good place. I have never had a chance to see the beaver themselves there, but certainly there are dams. And then otherwise, you know, there's some over by the um, Sonoma Ecology Center. Um, and there used to be a bunch down in Maxwell Park, but those kind of keep blowing out. Mm -hmm. Maxwell Farms Park. The regional park. Uh, it's usually when we're like trying to send people to a really fun place to go, we send them to downtown Napa onto Napa Creek. There's the Pearl Street Bridge right there, and there's a pedestrian bridge that is above the Beaver Dam that you can see the beaver swimming around in the pond, and then the car bridge, the vehicle bridge that has a sidewalk on it. You can look at the dam itself. And that's a great spot. And then you can, you know, walk around Napa and have a good day. So uh, definitely going out again, sunset is going to be the best time because that's when they're more likely to come out. Okay, great. Um, here's another question that has come up a couple of times. And this might, um, this is an interesting one to share with everyone. Um, 
the question is about volunteering and donating. So you did mention iNaturalist as a way to bring more beaver stories forward. Um, and that's really important for the research because you told us that we don't even know how many beavers there are in California. So that work with iNaturalist could be really important in helping inform um, science and, and how we're gonna go forward. Um, but what are some other ways that people can volunteer for beavers? You wanna take that one, Brock? Um. Sure. Uh, I was going to say that um, I was just responding actually to the uh, question about Tasmam Koyom and saying, because somebody asked about volunteering there. And um, I just, so there's a link to the Maidu Summit Consortium and you would need to reach out to that intertribal organization who are the, they, they have a, a, a cooperative management agreement with the local Feather River Land Trust and the Cal Fish and Wildlife there, but that process. And there's a campground on Yellow Creek there. Um, and so there's some opportunity possibly there. Um, otherwise, yeah, the volunteering, I think uh, Kate and I are, you know, we're running around the state and we're having policy meetings and we're doing things and at times we're installing beaver flow control devices, but it's so hit and miss. That it's not like we have a regular beaver volunteer day that we can be, um, but you could be in touch with us about that. Um, if you've got other beaver, yeah, the, there's the folks around South Lake Tahoe that are really active with their beavers. There's again, the folks in Napa that are really interested um, down in the San Luis Obispo Salinas area. There's the beaver brigade. Um, that's a really active community group of beaver believers down there. Um, if you're anywhere near the Scott River, the Scott Watershed, Scott River Watershed Council, they do a lot of amazing work for coho and they have beavers and BDAs. Um, the uh, Mid Klamath Watershed Council folks in near Orleans have a lot of beaver action there. Some Yurok tribal members in the Lower Russian, but I'm not sure about volunteering there. So I think trying to find Find your local beaver community. If you're anywhere near Chico, there's the Golden Beaver Distillery. You could go there and he has a little beaver museum. And then you can actually get, um, he distills spirits from rice that he then is branded around beaver themes. And, he, and a portion of his profits are donated to our beaver campaign. So, you know, go and, and, and you know, take your friends to the distillery. I don't know if that's volunteering, drinking for beavers, but um, it kind of is. <laughs> raise a glass um, for beavers. Yes. Yeah, raise a glass <laughs> to beavers, right? Um, no, so. and, I, and I, I, all, those are great suggestions, Brock. And, you know, I think ultimately we all need to figure out where the nearest beaver populations are to where we live and just start watching out for them. We need beaver keepers all over who just adopt a local beaver colony and really start paying attention and talking to the landowners, you know, making sure that if there are problems that they have resources to address those problems before they kill them and just really kind of spotlighting and highlighting and, and you know, we're working with some folks, you know, the mayor of St. Helena right now really wants to uplift the beaver in, in the upper Napa River. And so we're coming up with all sorts of ideas of like, wow, you could support your community and coming up with a beaver management plan of here's what we're going to do. And here's, you know, we're showing that we're committed to managing beaver in, in, in a way that's non-lethal if possible and really provide folks the, the resources to do that. So there's lots of places to intervene and um, and sure, you can just donate to other, you know, you can donate to our organization. We love, don we're, we're, you know, we are a nonprofit. So we really rely on donations and, and really appreciate that as do a lot of other organizations like the Sierra Wildlife Coalition up in the Tahoe Basin and Martinez Beavers and yeah. So hopefully, you know, and let us know what you do and, and what comes of it. Cause there's a lot of great, you know I would love to see a beaver brigade in every county. Like let's not let San, San Luis Obispo be the only county that has its own volunteer run beaver brigade. Let's have every county have one. I'm seeing parades right now. <laughs> People in beaver costumes and the beaver right? flags. <laughs> Well, if you haven't been to the Beaver Festival in Martinez, that's exactly what happens. There is a parade and there are flags and there are literally horses with beaver tails that show up. It's Oh, goodness. <laughs> <laughs> it's, 
Yep. Sounds fun. There's so many ways to celebrate wildlife. Exactly. Um, all right. Yeah. Here's another question. Does the city of Santa Rosa have a beaver management plan or the, does the city of Sebastopol? Not that I know of. So we're working with Sonoma Water to come up with some sort of beaver management strategy. And that is important because they have jurisdiction over, you know, a lot of the waterways that, that beaver will be inhabiting, but the municipalities themselves, uh, not that I know of. So that could be a great place to start as well of, hey, let's get the Sebastopol City Council to adopt a beaver friendly, you know, management plan since they do go by in, in the Laguna. And um, so, yeah, I think it's a great idea. Uh, another, along those lines, um, have you, has there been any assessment work done along the Laguna uh, for reintroduction of beavers along the Laguna? We haven't formally done that work, but I think our general sense is for, you know, the times we go canoeing and stand up paddle boarding and walking around the Laguna, that clearly, I think especially between the Occidental Gurnville Road and then where the outlet of Santa Rosa Creek is and that whole section down there where it meets up with Mark West before the main stem confluence, that whole lower section of Laguna to us looks like just a beaver palooza jungle waiting to happen. And we keep wondering, why those beavers that went down Santa Rosa Creek didn't just stop there and set up shop. And it's really hard to get into for anyone who's tried to get in there. So maybe we just need more eyes, intrepid folks squirreling their way down into some of those kind of jungles down there. If anyone's been in that lower portion of Laguna, it, you know, it's really thick and hard to get into. And access is not so easy down there, you know, as well for with a canoe or a boat. But um so we think it's probably highly, there's plenty of habitat, generally sufficient water with deep enough pools and areas and enough vegetation. Um, so we think they should be there. Yes, <laughs> we think so too. Um, thank you so much. Um, I know I learned a lot. I'm super excited to dig deeper as well, um, which to me is really the mark of a great presentation is you start learning how much you don't know and how, then there's so much more and all the directions you can go to increase your own personal knowledge. Um, so thank you for that. Um, let's see, Just, do you have any kind of closing remarks that we should end with? I see there's a lot of interest in the chat on the beaver flag. <laughs> in case anybody missed that, do you wanna promote that a little bit, Kate? Well, Brock has been putting in links in the chat. We, we do have our beaver flag hat and stickers and it's also on the back of our booklet. So you're welcome to go to our website to get some of those and we have, threatened to actually make the full-size flag and just haven't gotten around. If that's your, like, you know, forte, let us know. And you know, we'd love to work together and get a flag, an actual flag done. Um, so yeah, definitely check out the, the, the beaver flag. You know, the, the bear flag revolt started in the city of Sonoma. And so now we are fomenting the beaver flag revolution, which is, Considering the grizzly now, unfortunately, hasn't been extirpated, we're, we're going to celebrate uh, the beaver that survived extra, uh, near extirpation, so. All right, thank you. Brock, any closing words before we say goodnight? No, no, we're just super excited to see so many folks here, and thank you all, Laguna Foundation, and you personally, Christine, for hosting this and all the good work you do, and we're just happy to be here. And Go Team Beaver. Go Team Beaver. I second that. <laughs> all right. Thank you so much. Thank you to all of the people who participated this evening. Um, programs are made possible because you're interested in them. But, so thank you for showing up for our environment in Sonoma County um, and beyond. Um, keep an eye on your email because I will send a follow-up message that includes a bunch of these links uh, and more information for you, including the link to this recording. Um, I'll hopefully have it up on our YouTube channel by the weekend. Um, 
go ahead and visit our website, lagunafoundation.org, for information on upcoming events. And I know Brock and Kate are giving presentations all over, and there's great information on their website as well at oaec.org. Um, thank you for joining us tonight, and we look forward to seeing you at an upcoming event. Until then, be well. Good night. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye.